Okay, so welcome to part one of Great Jewish Personalities. Today we're going to be talking about one of the famous uh, scholars and leaders and heroes of all Jewish history, Rabbi Akiva. Now, Rabbi Akiva is a name that we've heard of, perhaps. Uh, He's one of the famous authors, one of the most uh, commonly uh, referenced authors of the Talmud and the Mishnah. Uh, And he has a very fascinating backstory. Now, his His family is a family of converts, and his life was unique because he uh, started off his life not in a great rabbinical dynasty or someone who with a very strong background in Jewish learning. Rather, he spent the first 40 years uh, as a total ignoramus, as a total am haaretz, but he would go on to become the greatest scholar of his generation, and not only that, be very critical uh, in this link that's going to connect the previous generation, the generation that survived the destruction of the temple, to the generation that's going to write down the mission. It's a very, very vital uh, and critical point in history where certain offices of, of Jewish life are going to cease, and there's going to be an in-between period before the next the next uh, era gets settled, and Rabbi Kiva's right there in the middle, and he plays a very crucial role in making sure that that trans- transition is smooth. He arrives at this scene towards the uh, destruction of the temple era. We don't know exactly when. He has a very long life. He dies in the year 136, and according to Jewish tradition, he was 120 when he died. So we assume that he was born in about the year 116 thereof, and he must have started studying uh, but, but in the 50s, not in the 1950s, in the 50s, just 50s. There's an interesting comment that he makes uh, once he's already a scholar, he makes to his students, and he tells them that when he was an Am Haaretz, when he was an ignoramus, he would say and hope and yearn, who's going to give me a Torah scholar so I could bite him like a donkey? Before he became a Torah scholar himself, he had such animosity towards the other scholars that he said, if only I met a Torah scholar and I could bite them like a donkey. So a student said to him, like a donkey? You know, who says that, to bite like a donkey? So he says, well, a dog who bites just bites. A donkey who bites, bites and actually breaks the bones. And I had such disdain and hatred towards the Torah scholars before I myself was one of them that I wanted to break their bones as well. It's a very interesting statement, and the commentaries really give some elaboration to this idea. Whenever we talk about uh, the word chamor or donkey in Jewish literature, it always has very, very deep meanings. The word chamor comes from the word chomer, which means physicality. And whenever we hear about donkeys in Jewish literature, it means one of two very, op- very opposing, very opposite ideas. Uh, on one hand, for example, we know uh, Bilam, the greatest villain of the Torah, of the Bible, he had a very intimate relationship with his donkey, which is really interesting. The Torah goes on to stress about that relationship uh, because he was someone who had, a, who had a conversation with a donkey. He was so immersed in physicality that he was on the same level. He was, in, he, you know, he was enmeshed, so to speak, in this relationship with the physical. Whereas Moses, he also has a donkey, but he's riding the donkey. He's in total control. He's supreme. He's the master. He has the reins. His, his relationship with his physical iteration is that he's the master, he's the rider, and he's in total control. Abraham, we're told, rides a donkey. Messiah, we're told in the future, will ride a donkey. There's stories in the Talmud about rabbis riding a donkey. It's very interesting. The Torah doesn't go out. The Talmud doesn't unnecessarily tell us the uh, modes of transportation, but it, but it refers to an idea. It, it, whenever we're told that someone's going to ride a donkey, that, that means that they're in total control, in total dominion over their physicality. Uh, not only that, in the end of Genesis, Jacob is blessing his children, and Yisachar, who is the son that is dedicated to Torah study, he compares him to a donkey. Just like a donkey is totally subservient to the load that he's carrying, so two great Torah scholars are totally committed to amassing a tremendous load of Torah study and taking, that, taking it with them wherever they go. And it's interesting that Rabbi Tiva even before he becomes a great Torah scholar, is linked to this idea. He was like a dunt. He wanted to bite and destroy the rabbis. It's almost as if he began as a dunty of, 
uh, of bitterness, of acrimony. He, wanted, he, he had animosity, and he took that ability and channeled it, so to speak, to the other kind of donkey, which is total commitment to Torah study. And it's an interesting motif we see where people have a certain disdain for Torah uh, before they get a, a relationship with it are usually the people that are going to have the most intimate and deep relationship with Torah once they are exposed to it. I had a student of mine in Israel who told me that before he really began studying Torah in any substantive way, he said the first time he ever had his cheeseburger was on Yom Kippur. Why? He said he, he, he didn't know anything. He was totally ignorant. But he had something, something driving him towards this anger that he says, oh, I'm going to do it on Yom Kippur. And he went, ended up in yeshiva. And, of course, the rest is history. And he became a fantastic Torah scholar. But the people that are kind of parv, as they say, neither here nor there are the ones that don't necessarily have that same fire within them, fire in their belly, and can't necessarily utilize that towards achieving some great uh, heights. Rabbi Kiva, even before he gets exposed to Torah study, he is someone that has a certain ferocity and uh, tenacity to him. Now, he, we, he was observant of Torah law, but he was ignorant. And we find st- a story about him that really demonstrates that he had impeccable character. His midos were unmatched. And the story the Talmud tells is really striking. What happened? He was a worker, he was working for someone for, for three years, uh, and after three years, he finished working, and it was the day before Yom Kippur, and he said, okay, now I worked for three years, the, his, uh, his employer was enormously wealthy, he worked for three years, and now he's asking to get paid, he wants to go back to his family. And the employer says, well, I'm sorry, I'm out of cash, I don't have any cash. He says, oh, no cash, no problem, why don't you pay me with fruits, with vegetation, with produce? Cash equivalent. He was a big landowner. He had lots of land. Pay me with that. He says, well, I don't have that either. He says, okay, give me real estate. Give me land. Give me property. He says, well, I don't have that either. Give me animals, livestock. I got none of that. Give me some vineyards. Maybe you have, and he looks around. There's vineyards as far as the eye could see. Well, I'm out of that as well. Well, give me like uh, home furnishings, like uh, blankets or pillows or something like that. And he says, oh, that I also have none. The guy's like, he's got nothing left. What does he do? He's disappointed. And he just goes home. And he goes home to his family with uh, three years of work that he's not going to get paid for. After the holiday, after circus, the employer comes and has with him his, you know, his, the payment, the uh, compensation for the three years of work. And not only that, he brings with him three donkeys, which is interesting. Let's mention donkeys, donkeys again, which should make your head spin. But f- laden donkeys with food and with drinks and all these delicacies and they ate and they drained together and they were just schmoozing about uh, times past. And then they have a conversation as to what, was, what, what, what were you thinking when I said I had nothing. So the, the, the employer says to him, says to Rabbi Kiva, what were you thinking about when I told you I don't have nothing? Did you suspect that maybe I was cheating you? He says, when, I, when you said that you had no money, I said, well, maybe you found a good deal, a good business deal, and all your money is tied up in this deal. And when I said to you, Where's, uh, maybe you have some livestock, I said, well, maybe, uh, maybe you lent out your livestock, your animals, to other people. And I said, well, maybe, what about uh, property? Then, I, then Rabbi Kiva responded, well, I said, well, maybe you have sharecroppers in the property, and therefore it's tied up as well. And when I said I have no fruits, I said, well, maybe the fruits weren't tithed. And when I said, you don't have any uh, home furnishings, I said, well, maybe you donated that to the temple. You donated that to the charity. And the employer says, by the way, every single thing that you said was true. Every single thing you said was true, but ultimately I found a way to navigate my, out, of, out of all these commitments, and now I want to pay you your, your money. And this, we know this is Rabbi Tiva when he was still a simpleton, so to speak. He was still working and has not, it has not gotten involved in Torah study at all, yet we see his character, especially uh, with judging favorably in this instance, that he's willing to concoct theories in his head to try to justify the bizarre, odd behavior of someone else and judge him favorably. Really interesting story. So what happens to Rabbi Kiva? So he's a total ignorant, ignoramus, and 
how did he get involved in Torah? So very interesting. The, the, we're given three different narratives. This, the, it's almost as if the story of Rabbi Tiva was cut up into three different pieces and scattered throughout the Talmud. We're just going to try to piece them all together. Uh, so he was 40 years old, and the Talmud tells that he was a shepherd. As we saw, he was tending to the animals. And he went to a well to feed his flock. And he saw there a bizarre stone by the, uh, by the well. And the stone had had a, uh, a drip of water that was persistently falling at a specific spot in the rock. And over the course of thousands of years, the water had penetrated, made a hole in the rock. And he was like analyzing this. And he had some sort of inspiration from this episode. And he said to him, he said to himself, he says, wait a minute, water is soft, but the rock is hard. And yet the soft water was able to penetrate the hard rock. So we see even something soft can penetrate something which is hard. Well, Torah is hard, and my heart is soft. So if the water can penetrate the rock, certainly the Torah, which is hard, can penetrate my heart, which is soft. So this was the first inspiration. And he said, okay, I'm 40 years old. I'm over the top, so to speak, right? I'm myself, I'm turning 30 in, in 34 days. So I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, yeah, that's it. My best days are behind me, over the hill, right? <laughs> Robert Kiva's over the hill. He's 40 years old. He doesn't know anything. But he says, ah, I'm, I'm, I'm still going to try. He goes uh, to study, and the Talmud describes that he starts r- literally from the beginning to learn how to read Hebrew. Concurrently, it seems like that that, that didn't really work out or, or worked out, but he just learned how to read and really become a scholar. But he was working for a man by the name of Kalba Savua. Kalba Savua was one of the wealthy uh, landowners in Jerusalem before the temple was destroyed. And in fact, in the narrative of the temple destruction, we're told that Kalba Savua was one of the big philanthropists that had uh, procured food and uh, provisions for the city of Jerusalem when it was under siege. When the Great Revolt had happened and the Romans encircled the city for many months, the people were starving, but they had uh, great warehouses of food because Kalba Savu was so wealthy and he had p- prepared for this eventuality. Unfortunately, the, uh, the, uh, the people in the city burnt down because they wanted to fight the Romans and they were worried that there was going to be complacency, so they burnt down the food storages and people were dying uh, of starvation. But either way, that's Kalba Savua, and that who was, that's the person who was Rabbi Tiva's employer, and he was working for him. And Kalba Savua's daughter saw him, and she was really impressed with him. So we see already about Rabbi Tiva, even though he's not a great scholar yet, but he, had, he really cuts an impressive figure. He's a very impressive character in his mannerisms, in his behaviorisms, in his quality of character. And she says to him, I'll get married to you, provided you pledge to go back to yeshiva, not just to learn how to read and to learn the basics, but to really full-time. Full-time. And they agree, and they, ha- they, get, they elope, they get married clandestinely. And when her father hears that his prized jewel of a daughter is getting married, got married to Rabbi Tiva, the guy who is his shepherd, who knows nothing, he disowned her. So now Rabbi Akiva and his young wife are totally on their own and it's, it's the winter and they're sitting there and just, they're, it's depressing. It's the, you know, he's not yet a Torah scholar yet. And she had come from a family of tremendous wealth and now they're, they have nothing. And Rabbi Akiva tells her, if I had, if I had all the money in the world, I'd buy you a special piece of jewelry with the imagery of Jerusalem, and it's going to be wonderful. He's trying to comfort her. Either way, they're sitting there by themselves in a cave. All they have is hay. And the Almighty sends Elijah the prophet to come visit them. Elijah the prophet comes, uh, masquerading as, as a poor person. He knocks in their cave, and he says to, says to them, Oh, my wife just had a baby, and we don't have any hay to place the baby on. We don't have like a cot for the baby. Could we have some? So Rekiva says, ah, oh, you see? There's someone who's even worse off than, than, than us. And that gave him a little bit of inspiration uh, to forge ahead. 
he eventually goes to yeshiva, they made a deal, he go to yeshiva, go study, and after 12 years, come back. That was their commitment. Just shows a little bit of concepts of what it means to study. You know, we like to study, we study for an hour a week. How many, what percentage of Jews in Houston study for an hour a week? And this is a 12-year commitment, that I'm sure, and I assure you, it wasn't like lots of coffee and cigarette breaks. Like, this was a total, inve- total immersion. 12 years, I'll see you in 12 years. We're going to learn. <laughs> so he goes to the scholars, Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Yeshua, who were to be his teachers, and he, be- he, be- he becomes a student. And, of course, he's building a, a very strong foundation in learning, and the Talmud describes a little bit of his modus operandi of study. Like, what would he do? And this is, we see really as a theme throughout his learning, throughout his scholarship, throughout his life. When the rabbi would teach something, he would teach a verse. Rabbi Akiva would take every letter of the verse and say, why does it say this letter? Why does it say that letter? Why does it say that letter? Every aleph, every base. He, Rabbi Akiva left no stone unturned. He was... He was, it's like the worst kind of student to have, to, who doesn't accept anything for granted, like doesn't assume, no, assumes nothing, and really starts from the most basic and builds from there. That was his method of studying. He studied and became a great scholar. After 12 years, not only was he a competent uh, scholar in his own right, he had already amassed a following of students that were totally dedicated to learning from him. After 12 years, time's up. He wants to go back to his wife. He goes back to his wife, and his wife, you know, poor, poor woman, she's by herself, her husband's away, and she's living, I'm sure, in, in, in abject poverty. And someone had come and told her that, what are you waiting for your husband? He's not going to make it anyhow. He's going to be a total failure, and you're a failure, and you shouldn't have, shouldn't have married him. That's when someone comes, and Rebecca Kiva's about to come into the door, and he hears this being said, this conversation going on behind closed doors. So he hears his wife tell this individual, the Talmud calls him a Russia, this wicked person. She says, well, if my husband was here, I'd tell him, you know what, I reconsidered, go for 24 years. I'd say, go back for another 12 years. Rabbi Kiva hears that, makes a quick U-turn, and heads back to the yeshiva. That's the story. There's a big debate as to did he walk in and say hi or not. I don't know. I, I take the position that he did. Others are sure that he didn't. That no, 12 plus 12 does not equal 24. There's a certain momentum that he had built up. He didn't want to lose it, and therefore he just he, he didn't stop for anything, and he just he just went right back. Either way, he went he went he went back. Um, now, th- th- and, and of course, after he's finished the 24 years of scholarship, he amasses a following of 24 thousand students, and they come back from the yeshiva, and he's the Gadol Adar, he's the greatest scholar of his generation, and everyone comes out to meet him, the, the famous Rabbi Tiva is coming, and his wife is also there, the cheap seats, and she tries to elbow her way to the front, and some of her students, some of Rabbi Tiva's students say, oh, what's this woman doing here? They didn't know who she was, and Rabbi Tiva says the famous words, Shali, Shalachem, Shalahi, my Torah and your Torah, all my students, is all in her merit. And the, the, the epilogue of this story is that another pe- person came to visit him, and that was his father in law, Kabba Savua. He was unaware, this was the greatest style. He, has, he had no idea this was the same Akiva that was a total ignoramus 25 years prior. And he was having second thoughts about disowning his daughter. And the problem is that he had made a halachic vow that he, she could never benefit from him. And one of the laws, that under certain circumstances, it would be possible to revoke a halachic vow if there is a good reason why. But you would have to have a rabbi sound off on that. So the big rabbi comes to town, and he comes to him, and he says to him, well, I want to reconsider. Well, what's the story? Well, my daughter married some ignoramus, and I disowned her, <laughs> and... Now I want to change that position. So the, the halacha is, is that the only way you're allowed to do that is if you had imperfect information at the time. It means had you known at the time, or the reality, you wouldn't have done it. So Rabbi Kiva asked him, well, had you known that your new son-in-law would become a Torah scholar, would you have made this vow to disown your daughter? 
And he says, if I knew that he learned even one Mishnah, I, would, I wouldn't have made that. He says, oh, Shalom Aleichem, I'm your son-in-law. And of course, the rest is history. Rotiva became, and his family became inordinately wealthy. And in fact, what he had pledged, that piece of wonderful jewelry that he had pledged to buy her, uh, indeed, he, he, bought, he bought her uh, fulfilling his promise. Now, I think there's a few takeaways from the story. First of all, Rabbi Tiva, you know, he saw a rock with a hole in it. That's how it all got started. What would have happened if Rabbi Tiva had not seen this rock? It's almost as if, you know, we say, when we look at the big picture of, of Jewish history, we, we, we say that Rabbi Tiva was a vital link that without Rabbi Tiva, we wouldn't have Torah. Like us sitting here studying Torah together, that's only because of Rabbi Tiva. And Rabbi Tiva, he was tit started by this rock. So we should find this rock and make a monument for it. No, because essentially we only exist because of this rock that has a hole in it, right? Is that a fair assessment? I, th- I think the answer is no. I think that Rabbi Tiva was primed for inspiration. You and I would see the rock and say, eh, how cool is that? Snap a picture of it, right? We have a nice rock with a hole. It's a nice, perfectly cylindrical hole. Wow, so interesting. Would we change our lives? Probably not. Rabbi Tiva was primed. He had something about him that allowed him to take his inspiration and really turn his life around because of it. And I think that's really interesting. It really kind of shows a little bit, a window into his character. He was someone that was very sensitive, very sensitive to the things that he encountered, and that allowed him to take the inspiration that could be there for us. Like, we could all meet our rock, so to speak, with a hole in it, that could potentially inspire us to become great people. It's just that most of us, or not most of us, but most of the world, some people or some in the world would not necessarily say, oh, there's a rock with a hole in it, let me change my life. You know, what made Rabbi Kiva special was not that he met the rock, but ra- rather that he took that inspiration and really injected it into his heart, so to speak, and said, I'm going to change my life. And not only that, what did he say? He says, well, if the water could penetrate the rock, Torah could, could penetrate my heart. And this is a theme of Rabbi Tiva's life, that the Torah study that he did was not tr- to try to populate his mind with Torah ideas. It was all about integrating it into your heart. In fact, there is a debate, there's many debates about Rabbi Tiva in the Talmud. Rabbi Tiva is one of the central players in the Talmud of the Mishnah. Uh, but there was a discussion that a bunch of rabbis had. After the temple's destroyed, many of the rabbis are living underground, and we're told in several instances in the Talmud that rabbis were hiding in an attic in a fellow by the name of Nitza. He had a house in Lod city, in the central Israel, and a bunch of rabbis were huddling together in his attic, hiding from the Romans. And the Talmud records several debates or discussions that they had during that time. So one of the questions that they had was, what's greater? Torah study or mitzvahs, ma'ase, actions. Rabbi Tarfon, who is one of Rabbi Akiva's sparring mates in Torah, he says, a mitzvah is greater than Torah study. He says, Rabbi Akiva, no, 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 Torah study is greater because Torah study brings a person to action. So if you study Torah, you'll have both. You'll have both a mitzvah that will result from the Torah study and the Torah study itself. And I was thinking, Rabbi Tiva is the one who tells us that Torah study is hard, that goes into your heart, penetrates your heart. The way Rabbi Tiva studied, the method that he used when he studied Torah was to try to find a way to take the Torah and inject it into his heart. That kind of study is surely going to bring to a change in behavior. For most people, maybe those, the people that he was arguing, that this idea wasn't as clear to them and therefore, when they study Torah, they study Torah. Yeah, it's not t- Torah st- maybe a mitzvah is better. Maybe in isolation, a mitzvah is greater than Torah study. But the way Rabbi Kiva studied, if he studied, it guaranteed it would change his behavior. What about his scholarship? When we looked with some stories that told about his scholarship, absolutely legendary. We already mentioned that he was very fastidious about trying to investigate the meaning behind every letter of the Torah, left no stone, un- stone unturned. But there's a story, a remarkable story that's told in Talmud uh, that really brings this point home. 
Uh, now, this story is, is interesting on several accounts because it actually happens not to Rabbi Akiva, it happens to Moses. Moses is around 1,500 years before Rabbi Akiva, more or less, I think 1,400 years, if you want to be more precise. And Moshe is going up to the heavens to get the Torah. And the Talmud describes, this is the Talmud in Menachos 29b, that Moshe finds the Almighty writing a Torah scroll. And he notices that there is these images that the Almighty is making on top of the letters. If you look at a Torah scroll, you'll notice several letters have these little crowns on top of them, these little embellishments to the letters. So Moshe is asking God, you're writing a Torah. It's the greatest book ever written. Do you actually need to add this nice calligraphy? Like, why are you doing this? Like, why do you have to embellish a Torah scroll like this? So the Almighty tells him, there is a man who is going to come many, many generations hence, and his name is Akiva ben Yosef, Akiva the son of Joseph, Rabbi Akiva, and he is going to take these little embellishments on top of the letters and actually deduce Torah laws from those embellishments, from those little crowns on top of the letters. And in every crown, every jot and tittle of the Torah, he's going to deduce piles and piles of laws. Well, this really shows a little bit of Rabbi Akiva. Like, to Rabbi Akiva, even the letters themselves and the, the, the designs on top of the letters, all that was from God, and all that thus, if it's from God, it can't be meaningless. You know, to us, like, well, a letter here, a letter there, like, well, does it really make a difference? If it's spelled like this, it's spelled like that. Uh, the Talmud says that every time it said et, et is like the, it's a common word that appears in every sentence in Torah. Every time it said the word et, Rabbi Kiva would say, well, what's this, what does this mean? And when he got to uh, et Hashem Elokecha Tira, you should fear God. Well, what is et, which seems to add, how could you fear something like God? Says Rabbi Kiva, well, that's the, to- that's the Torah scholar. It also is someone uh, deserving of awe as well. Interesting. You know, Moshe sees the Almighty making these designs, and he says, oh, there's this man, Rabbi Akiva, sometime in the future. And he asks the Almighty, well, show him to me. And herein we have the first episode of time travel. In fact, I think the only episode of time travel described in the Torah. And he, he says to him, okay, show him to me. Instantly, Moshe has teleported 1,400 years into the future, and he is suddenly sitting in Rabbi Kiva's lecture hall, and he's there, and Rabbi Kiva's giving a, a lesson, and Rabbi, Rabbi Kiva's giving the lesson, and Moshe doesn't understand it. It's really bizarre, and he's like, he's getting depressed. How is it possible that I, I'm the one who's teaching Torah, I don't understand it? Finally, the students ask Rabbi Kiva, well, where's the source of this law? And he tells them, this is a halacha Moshe Messinai, this is a law that comes from Moshe at Sinai, and Moshe, who finally hears this, is placated by the fact that he is still being invoked uh, many, many years later. He goes back to the Almighty, and he tells the Almighty, you have Rabbi Akiva, and you give the Torah via me. Moshe is arguing that Rabbi Akiva is a more worthy candidate to give the Torah to the Jewish people than he is, just to give a little insight into the scope of Rabbi Akiva's scholarship. There's another story where... There was a Rhodes scholar who uh, was uh, perpetrating a, a Torah principle against the Sanhedrin. And this was a little bit dangerous because this guy was a, you know, the most dangerous heretic is the heretic that is also a scholar because they can, they can kind of substantiate their claims based upon Torah. So this guy was a Rhodes scholar. And apparently, everyone was scared to meet him because he had 300 pieces of evidence to prove his position. And finally, Rabbi Tiva encountered him, and he lays before him his 300 pieces of evidence, and Rabbi Tiva swats him like flies. All 300 proofs that uh, this individual brought, Rabbi Tiva was able to thwart them. And the Gemara there ends with a remarkable statement wherein this individual tells Rabbi Tiva, Atta or Tiva ben Yosef, you're the famous Rabbi Tiva that whose name goes from one end of the world to the other end of the world. You think you're so wonderful. The truth is, you're nothing greater than a shepherd, a shepherd of large animals. And Rabbi Tiva responds to him, No, no, no. I'm like a shepherd of small animals, of, of sheep. 
Okay, so what's interesting from this story is that he tells him, you're the famous Rabbi Kiva whose name goes from one end of the world to the other end of the world. So the commentators there say that if you take the words misofa olam va'ad sofo from one end of the world to the other end of the world and you count up the gematria, that equals the amount of times Rabbi Kiva's name is mentioned in the Talmud, which is really interesting. But either way, he tells him, you're so great, you think your name goes from one end of the world to the other end of the world, you should know you're nothing greater than a shepherd of large animals. And he tells him, no, I'm not a shepherd of large animals, I'm a shepherd of small animals. It seems like Rabbi Akiva is teaching us a lesson in humility. When this guy tells him, you're nothing more than a shepherd of large animals, Rabbi Akiva tells him, no, I'm smaller, I'm a shepherd of small animals. When in reality, I think that what Rabbi Akiva was really telling him was about the scope of Torah. This individual, this rogue scholar, was telling Rabbi Akiva, you think you're so great? The truth is that Torah is infinite. Torah is infinite, and thus your knowledge of Torah vis-a-vis what Torah really is, it's nothing more than a shepherd of large animals, which is insignificant. He says, Rabbi Kiva, no, I'm a shepherd of small animals, i.e. Torah is even greater. He's not minimizing his accomplishment in Torah, rather he's augmenting the Torah at large. Now there's a very interesting theme we see with Rabbi Kiva throughout his life. The story goes that Rabbi Kiva had a, had a motto, and his motto was, everything that the Almighty does is for the good. Kol to avid rachmana letav avid. Everything the Almighty does is for good. And there was once an episode where Rabbi Kiva was traveling, and he reached a certain city that he was looking for a place to stay overnight. He goes to all the motels, and he goes to all the inns, and no, one's, no, one, no one has any room. And he says, his famous motto, everything the Almighty does is for the good, and he says, okay, I'll go to the forest, and I'll stay in the forest. He has with him a candle so he could study. He has with him a, a rooster, to, like an alarm clock, to wake him up in the morning, and he has also with him a, uh, a, a donkey that he's using to travel. In the middle of the night, a wind comes and blows out his candle. He says everything he does is for the good. Animals come and pounce upon his rooster and his donkey, and he's left with, without anything. And of course, he says everything that the mighty does is for the best. And he wakes up in the morning, and he meets an individual along the way who's running away, like, t- totally uh, mad-eyed. And he says, well, what's going on? What happened? Apparently, bandits descended upon that, upon that city, and they killed everyone in town. So Rabbi Kiva says, oh, had I been in town, had someone rented me a room, I would have been one of the victims, and had my candle or my animals given me away, they would have come after me even in the forest. So that's an interesting story about Rabbi Kiva and his relationship to the question of what, of what to do when bad things happen. Uh, it's always a very positive spin. Now, it gets a little bit more serious uh, with the episode describing the death of his teacher. The Talmud tells us that his teacher, Rabbi Yezer, if you remember, when he went to study, he went to Rabbi Yezer and Rabbi Yoshua. So he has a very a lifelong relationship with his teachers, and particularly with Rabbi Eliezer. Uh, Rabbi Eliezer was also a very fascinating character, uh, and he was someone who was a um, monumental Torah scholar. Uh, but he, towards the end of his life, he was getting ill. He's on his deathbed. And his students came to visit him. So Rabbi Tiva and his students, they come, and he's writhing in pain. He was in terrible agony because of his illnesses. And he tells them there's great fury in the world. Right? The Almighty was treating him so with such agony, with such suffering, uh, that he was just he was telling his students that he's in such he can't he can't believe how much anger the Almighty has in the world because he's treating him in such in, in such a manner. So all the students they hear, they see their, they see their teacher suffering, and they all start crying. And Rabbi Kiva is there as well, and he starts laughing. People are like embarrassed. Can you imagine? The rabbi is there in, the pa- in bed. He's writhing in pain. And all the students can't believe it. He says there's this great fury. Everyone's crying. It's such an emotional, such a sad scene. And Rabbi starts to laugh. So they say to him, why are you laughing? And he says to them, well, why are you crying? So they say to them, oh, why are we crying? This is a, a veritable Torah scroll is in pain. 
and we shouldn't cry? This is the best reason to cry. You see, Rabbi Eliezer, our teacher, and he's in pain, we, of course we should cry. So Rabbi Kiva says, well, that's exactly why I'm laughing. Why? Because Rabbi Eliezer's whole life, he was wealthy, things worked out for him, and I never, nothing ever went bad for him. And we have a principle that for whatever, every sin that someone does, they have to address it. Now, if they address it in the form of suffering in this world, then they're cleansed from their sins. But if they're not addressed in this world, then they're going to have to count for them once they die in Olam Abba, in the next world. And I was worried, my whole life I'm surveying Rabbi Eliezer, and nothing ever went bad for him. And therefore I'm terrified that there's something, you know, there's a surprise awaiting for him, a bad surprise, when he gets to Olam Abba because he never had to deal with the sins. But now that I see him suffering here, I know that his Olam Abba, his Olam Abba is, is complete, is untainted, and that's why I'm so delighted. That's the give and take that they have. Rabbi Eliezer hears this and he says, wait a minute. You're saying that I may have some sins that are unaccounted for. What is it? You're for, you've seen me sin in some way? He says to him, Rabbi Kiva responds to his teacher and tells him, well, you yourself taught us, there's no righteous person in the world who does good and never sins. You yourself said that. So everyone sins. There's no perfect person. So everyone needs to address it. If you don't address it here, you'll have to address it there. And therefore, it's very positive to, to get your penitence, so to speak, for your sins here and be done with it. And it's an interesting theme we see uh, throughout his life. He was always very, very optimistic. And this is not, a, not an easy time to be, to be Jewish, to be in Israel between the destruction of the Second Temple and the writing down of the Mishnah. That kind of 120-year period, very tenuous period, Rabbi Kiva always had optimism. Uh, so much so that the famous story is told that he's walking with his colleagues and they get to the city of Jerusalem, which is a heap of ruins. When the Romans destroyed the Temple in the year 70, they totally destroy the whole city. Everything's burned down to the ground. No Jews will have to go back into it. So it's just a, a pile of rubble. The city that was once teeming with Jews, it had the temple, it was the epicenter of Jewish life. There's nothing there. And Rabbi Akiva's walking with his colleagues, Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Yeshua, and they see in the distance the smoldering city of Jerusalem. And they see animals, road animals walking through there. All his colleagues start crying. And he starts laughing again. And they say to him, why are you, why are you laughing? Look at the sight. It's just a sight of devastation for our, for our people. How could you possibly be optimistic and be laughing about this? So he says, well, you ask me why I'm laughing. I want to ask you why you're crying. They say, wait a minute. Our, our temple is a heap of runes. There's animals uh, maroding through the city of Jerusalem. We shouldn't cry? He says, well, that's exactly why I'm laughing. And he has an intricate idea here where he says, he quotes a bunch of verses, and the verses indicate uh, it it connects individuals that are hundreds of years apart. And what he says is, is that there's two prophecies. One prophecy that foretells the destruction of Jerusalem and another prophecy that foretells the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And they're linked together. So Rabbi Kiva says, now that I see that the prophecy of the downfall of Jerusalem is true, now I know I'm comforted in knowing that the second prophecy that's linked together of the rebuilding and the renaissance of Jerusalem, that is also true. Always had a very positive spin on things. And in that story, his colleagues tell him, Akiva nechamtanu, Akiva nechamtanu, Rabbi Akiva, our friend, you comforted us. Now, he, towards the end of his life, he was the unquestioned leader of the people. He was, he played a very important part in the Bar Kokhba rebellion. Bar Kokhba was a great Torah scholar and a great warrior who mounted a revolt against the Romans in the year 132. The backstory to this is that the Emperor Hadrian 
He was uh, one of the most terrible humans that have ever lived. He undertook a systematic effort to try to eradicate the Jewish people, starting with the, with the rabbis and the rabbinates, and going after the common folk by making observance of Torah in any public fashion uh, punishable by death. If, if, people, if a mother would circumcise their child, they'd kill them both. People taught Torah publicly would be executed. People who conferred smicha, smicha is a very critical office in Jewish life, because smicha is ordination of, of rabbinical uh, authority that's conferred from one rabbi to the other rabbi. And the Sanhedrin, which was the last bastion of Jewish central authority, that, was, that hinged on rabbis being able to perpetuate in the form of conferring smicha to the next generation of rabbis. So Hadrian said, if anyone conveys, confers smicha, ordination to a young rabbi, the conferring rabbi, the receiving rabbi, and the entire city in which the ordination was conferred would all be slaughtered. Really, really horrible stuff. Uh, so in response to this, Bar Kokhba organized a rebellion that was the most successful rebellion in all of Roman history because they managed uh, in, the, in the middle of Pax Romana, the, in the apex of, of Roman rule, they managed to actually kick the Romans out of Israel to reestablish sovereignty for a couple of years and all that, to mint coins. And really everyone was so sure that Bar Kokhba is the Messiah and we're, you know, it's only uh, you know, a 60-year exile and we're back to where we started. No, of course, unfortunately, we know the, the, the uh, story didn't go as planned. Bar Kokhba went a little bit awry. And Rabbi Kiva, uh, who was his supporter, withdrew his support, all the rabbis withdrew his support, and it ended very poorly with the Romans coming back with greater numbers and greater ferocity and causing a destruction that outweighed the destruction of 60 years prior of Jerusalem and the temple. In fact, the city of Betar. Uh, that's when the city of Betar fought. It was the last stand of Bar Kokhba. And the Talmud goes as far as to say that the death of Betar was so vast and numerous that the non-Jewish farmers that were, in the, that were in the area, they didn't need to fertilize their field for seven years because of all the blood. All the blood of the Jewish dead was enough to fertilize the fields for seven years afterwards. That's at the end of Rabbi Tiva's life. So there's this, what's known as, it's known in Jewish literature as the Shmad, which is the effort to systematically eradicate the Jewish people. Uh, one of their rules was no public teaching of Torah. Rabbi Tiva is the venerated sage of his time. He is teaching Torah anyhow. And there's an individual by the name of Papas ben Yehuda. He comes over to Rabbi Tiva and says to him, Are you nuts? You know what the Romans are saying. You know they're executing, assassinating rabbis everywhere. What are you doing? Why are you teaching Torah publicly? So he tells him, I want to give you a, a, a parable. I'm going to give you an analogy. A wily fox, one of the most clever animal, right? He goes to the edge of the water, and he sees a, a pool of fish that are dodging something. And the fox asks the fish, why, what are, you, what are you hiding from? What are you dodging? What are you, what are you running away from? So he says, so, they, so the fish respond that there's fishermen, and the fishermen have nets, and we're trying to evade the nets. So the fox tells the fish, what's the problem? Why don't you jump up on, onto land? There's no nets. You see nets anywhere? There's no nets anywhere. Come here, and you'll be safe from the nets. That's the counsel that they dispense, that, that, he, that the fox dispenses to the fish. And the fish respond to them, you're the most clever animal? If we're in trouble in the water, which gives us oxygen, which gives us life, how much more trouble will we be if we're out of the water, we're out of our life source? So Rabbi Kiva tells Papas Ben Yehud, he says, yes, right now we have to dodge and evade the Romans. But if we're out of the water, if we're out of Torah, if we're out of our life blood, then we're for sure dead. We know you, you, if you take uh, one link out of the chain, if you take the Jews away from Torah for even one generation, that's it, we're done. So, yes, it's dangerous. But what's even more dangerous is for us to stop studying Torah. And the story goes on to say that they seized Rabbi Akiva, 
Not only that, they also seized Papas ben Yehuda, and they ended up in the same cell, which is ironic. Uh, he got caught for some other reason, and then he lamented the fact, at least Rabbi Tiber, we both ended up in the same cell, but at least you got here as a martyr dedicating your life to Torah study, perpetuated, perpetuation of Torah. I got here from some sort of tax evasion or something like that. We both ended up in the same place. And the story goes that Rabbi Tiva was being taken to be executed. And they did it in a very horrible, horrific, brutal, and cruel manner, as the Romans are famous for. They flayed him. They scraped his skin off of him. Really, really unbelievable cruelty. And as he's being killed in public fashion, the way they would do it, Rabbi Tiva starts saying the Shema. And the students are there. You can imagine what kind of atmosphere this is like. The greatest scholar, he's 120 years old. He was caught for teaching Torah. And these, these just barbaric Romans are now flaying his skin. And what's he doing? The rabbi's saying the Shema. And he says, Shema Yisrael Shem Rakhna Shema. And he starts saying the Shema. And the students are saying, This is what you're doing now? And he tells them, He says, His whole life, every time he said Shema, he was sad. Because what's the Shema? Shema is we're dedicating your life to God. We're accepting upon ourselves the yoke of God. And then we say, Ve'ahavta, the verse of Ve'ahavta, you have to love God with all your hearts, with all your life, with all your resources. What does it mean to love God with your whole, with your whole life? Even if God takes your life away, you have to love Him. You can't say, oh, I'm going to abandon God because my life is on the line. No. The mitzvah is, even if your life is online, you still stick to God. You're more committed to God than you are to your life. It says Rabbi Kiva to the students, my whole life I'm reading this verse, and I'm sad. Because when can I finally fulfill this mitzvah? The whole life I'm waiting to do this mitzvah. I'm, I'm sitting here, waiting for any opportunity to give up my life for God, and it's not showing up. And now that I finally have the opportunity to do what I've been coveting for so long, I shouldn't say the Shema. I shouldn't fulfill the mitzvah. It's just so interesting that it uses almost the same exact words. He starts off his life as the ignoramus that says, who's going to give me a Torah style that I can bite? And then he becomes a great style and says, who's going to give me an opportunity to give up my life in martyrdom? That's the dramatic transformation that he undergoes. And... As he says the word Echad of Shema, his soul departs, and a batko, which is a prophetic voice, announced, Praiseworthy are you, Rabbi Tiva, because you are invited to Olam Haba. What's interesting about the story is that we know the halacha. The halacha is that if someone comes to you and says, Well, do idolatry or else we kill you. So it's a halacha, you have to give up your life for God. Give up your life, even behold nafshcha. To us, this is... Uh, suboptimal situation. If, if it ever comes to this, if the unfortunate situation ever arises that we are confronted with God or our life, we have to choose God. That's the way we uh, should see it or maybe do see it. Rabbi Kiva, to him, not giving up his life, that's suboptimal. Because he, that's what he wanted. He wanted, he said, oh, I'm, I want to do this mitzvah. Give me the opportunity to achieve this pinnacle of giving up your life for Kiddush Hashem, for sanctification of God's name. The Talmud gives us a remarkable eulogy of Rabbi Tiva, and it says, from the time of Rabbi Tiva's death, there's no more Torah honor. Rabbi Tiva was the last person who embodied the honor of Torah. And Rashi explains because he gave his heart to try to derive every single design atop of every letter. There's nothing more honorsome to Torah than when someone really attributes it to God. If you attribute it to God, then there's nothing superfluous. If there's nothing superfluous, then every little design atop of a letter, well, if it's from God, well, then it has a purpose. Rabbi Kiva really embodied that, uh, that, that spirit. And in fact, you know, we, we mentioned this already, but he is this vital link because he is the one who is able to teach the Torah under these harsh conditions and create cadres of students that eventually amount uh, to the renaissance that's going to happen 80 year, uh, 50 years after his death once things settle a little bit. 
Uh, the Talmud tells us the day Rabbi Kiva died, Rabbi Judah the prince was born, who was kind of the next era, the changing of the guards. He's going to write down the Mishnah that's going to secure the Jewish people because to take the oral Torah and create a, a, a mobile, portable version of it in the form of the Mishnah really uh, guarantees survival of Torah, but Rabbi Kiva's time wasn't, it wasn't a sure thing, and Rabbi Kiva's one who is really most critical in that era, a really heroic ca- character, very positive and optimistic one, someone who really connected to Torah and to God at a very emotional level, someone who taught us about what Torah study is, it's about integration ideas into your heart, someone who is, sees the opportunities for inspiration, who saw a hole in the rock, so what? Change your life, right? That's what he'll do. Someone who is totally committed to Torah study, someone of incredible an impeccable character and ethical refinement, Moshe legitimately said would have been a formidable option if we wanted to find someone throughout Jewish history who was going to give us the Torah. Very inspiring character uh, that still inspires legions of young Jews unto this day.